Extraordinary ministers are an abomination. They were instituted by Protestants 500 years ago to destroy belief in the real presence. And you can say the proof is in the pudding. Jesus said, judge it by its fruits. Now 90% of the Catholics don't believe. Why? Because they waltz up like fast food. In nomine Patri, sit fili, spiritu santi. Amen. Firstly, for those of you who are veterans of the Latin Mass, the dogmatic holy sacrifice of the Mass, the Mass of the Ages, the only Mass that is part of our dogma of the Church, clarified and made crystal clear at Trent, you will readily notice, I don't know if you knew this, this part or not, but there's something like 73 different ways I can commit a mortal sin if I get sloppy up there at the altar, if I make a mockery of the holy sacrifice where we represent the sacrifice of Calvary. If I get sloppy up there, that's a sin on my part, a grave sin. Well, I wasn't being sloppy, but I'll have to say, despite all the efforts we made to be totally prepared for today, even as I was up at the altar, I realized, uh-oh, my altar cards, they're back at home. So I'll be going through the missile uh, if you see that they're not there, that was uh, a, an oversight on my part. I apologize. Your family, I was urged to stick to the Holy Eucharist during our meditation. That is, after all, why we're gathered here today. What brings us together? What has brought Catholics for 2,000 years together? The Holy Eucharist, the real presence our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. It's difficult to focus on how we get the Holy Eucharist without some inclusion of the fact that the Holy Eucharist only comes through the Catholic Church and only if the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is properly celebrated. And here we are in the midst of the only dogmatic holy sacrifice of the Mass, representing, as I said earlier, the sacrifice on Calvary by which we receive the Holy Eucharist, without which, without which, we do not have life within us. I didn't make that up. Jesus said it. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said, and then he suffered and he died on Calvary so that we could receive him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we celebrate and rejoice in his ultimate sacrifice because that is how we are able to receive him. I don't need to tell you that. You know it's John chapter 6, the bread of life discourse where so many of the Jews saved the apostles just up and left him. Matthew or uh, John 666. That's not an accident. It's one of those God coincidences. The problem is, although you and I know the truth of John chapter 6 in the Bread of Life discourse, there are so many in the chantries and rectories who don't believe a single word of it. And God gave us a brain and he expects us to use it. You've heard me say that before. The reason 90% of Catholics in growing, when I was in seminary, it was around 50%, and I've watched the decline over the last 16 years. Jesus said you can judge things by their fruits. He commands us to judge things by their fruits. And when I was in the seminary in the early 2000s, it was only 50% only 50 of Catholics who didn't believe in the Holy Eucharist, and now it's about 90%. God gave us a brain. He expects us to use it. The reason why 90% of Catholics no longer believe in the real presence of our Lord is because about the same percentage of bishops, cardinals, and popes don't believe. Some of you have heard me recount the true story when the bishop, and I believe it was Sacramento, asked Father Crappie to do a series on the catechism of the Catholic Church and while he's discerning whether or not he should stop what he's doing, doing his parish missions every week to go do this long 24, one hour each series on the catechism, Cardinal Ratzinger called him from Rome and said, hey, I'd like you to do that. Well, you don't say no. 
to Cardinal Ratz and their future Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So we went down there, but the important point about all this is that the bishop of, and I'm pretty sure it was Sacramento, the bishop of that diocese in California at the time, 1995, said to Father Crappie, Father, I don't know what to do. Half my priests do not believe in the real presence. That was 1995. Dear family, it hasn't gotten any better since then. It's gotten worse. Half my priests do not believe. If the priest does not believe, then he does not consecrate. And if you're not receiving the, whole, the real presence, whether you like it or not, because the priest isn't consecrating, you're out of luck. On a sad but humorous note, think of that diocese in California. Think of all of California. Ask yourself a simple question. Do the people of California act like they have the real life of Jesus within them? Just Tuesday, Gavin Newsom signed a law that banned schools, made it illegal for a teacher to give parental notification, outlawed that, of a child, of their child, identifying as transgender. I mean, our lady, Fatima, said the final battles, faith and family, and there's Gavin Newsom in all of California's interfering with the relationship between parent and child. The parents co-create with God, the child, and yet the government is interposing themselves between parents and children. Do those people in California believe in God, believe in the real presence? Heck no. God does indeed damn Gavin Newsom in every Californian legislature, legislator who voted for that law and every Californian who supported and votes for Newsom. And those legislatures, legislators, people wonder why I say you cannot be Catholic and a Democrat. I think it's pretty obvious. I didn't even think I was going to cause a stir by saying something so obvious, but there you have it. Back to the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the only dogmatic holy sacrifice being the traditional Latin Mass, and the only place on earth through which one may receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist is here in the Catholic Church. And that is the deposit of faith. That is unchanged and unchangeable. That is truth. And each and every bishop, cardinal, or pope who schisms from that truth damns himself by his heresy. They have no authority on God's earth to change the words of Jesus and his unequivocal meaning that has been handed down to us and changed and unchangeable. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. Seems like a fairly obvious thing in the gospel. Fairly obvious. I want to share with you two horror stories, sacrileges against, actually, I think it's three, sacrileges against the Holy Eucharist, which identify why it is we're here today, why we are so reverent, so blessed. Father Fashi led that Eucharistic procession. What a glorious procession. Two, two stories. When I was not yet in seminary, I was serving as an extraordinary minister. I was never comfortable with it at the time. Unworthy, I still feel unworthy to be at the altar. I was there, went up to the altar at the appropriate time during the holy sacrifice of the mass, and, and we were short an extraordinary minister, as so often happens. You're never short a priest at mass, there's gotta be one there, right? These extraordinary ministers. So Father Ted announced from the altar, we're short, an extraordinary minister, could we have one of you volunteer? And up jumps this woman, races to the front, dead run, gets up and stands next to me, and I look over at her and I'm thinking, well, I don't know who you are. <laughs> but I'm a, we're all creatures of habit. I'm a 10 o'clock in the morning mask guy. Maybe she says what I'm thinking. Maybe she's from the Saturday afternoon that somewhat hoax of a massive anticipation. We get done with Mass, and you know the starting ministers are supposed to consume the rest of the precious blood before they walk back up to the altar. In case they spill it, they want to prevent spilling. That's the excuse that they use, consume it before you come back up. Well, listen, when is it most full? When is that chalice most full? When you step away from the altar as an extraordinary minister with a chalice of the precious blood. 
their common sense seems to be lost on the people who feed us that line of baloney. Well, anyway, we get done with the holy sacrifice at the Mass, process out, and I'm out in the back talking to people. Father Ted's talking to people. I get done, and I go back in, and I walk into the sacristy just in time to see that woman who I did not know pouring a chalice of precious blood back into the bottle of wine. I know. I know. I was a, a, a laity at the time. I didn't know what I know now. But I immediately stopped dead in my tracks and I said, what are you doing? And, and she stops doing all right. She's doing, startled. Like as if she's not doing anything wrong, like a deer in headlights. But just at that moment then, Father Ted had finished talking. He came up and he stood next. He came in next to me and I said, Father Ted, she just poured the precious blood back into that bottle of wine. He stopped dead in his tracks. Then he turns to me and he said, words I will never forget. You know what we must do? <laughs> it was easy for him to say he just had to walk across a parking lot to the factory. I had been fasting. I had empty stomach. And the accidents remain, as Thomas Aquinas helped us understand it. I didn't know if in my whole life I've had against a half a bottle of wine in one sitting. But I was consuming precious blood. How is it? How is it this? Now, this is back in the 1990s. How is it that somebody back then, despite all the the hell we've gone through and the destruction of our sacred liturgy since then, how is it that somebody who claims to be an extraordinary minister doesn't know it's the precious blood? Well, she was from the Diocese of Saginaw. At one time, I think Michigan had those, the worst set of bishops in the entire country, and that guy down in Saginaw didn't want to ordain any more men to the priesthood until the church changed its teaching, as if the church could, and started ordaining women. What kind of bishop would teach that, would do that. Well, that's why this person didn't know it was precious blood. The sacrileges are two columnists. The sacrileges across the country, is it any wonder, is it any wonder people don't believe in real presence in the Holy Eucharist? I can tell you this, while we were planning today, we were going through such vigorous planning, trying to figure out how we can reverently get you on uh, that to receive the Holy Eucharist. As you can see, there's just not much room up here, and we were, the logistics were a little complex. I think John Henry has talked about how we're going to do it now, uh, back there where there's room to kneel if you can, to receive on the tongue, which is the only way that is, it's the ordinary way to receive Holy Communion. This whole baloney that Cardinal Bernadine, he who celebrated the Mass under the rainbow flag in Chicago, he's the one that pushed through and violated of every, it, when he pushed that through, it was, it was like, what, what do you call those, uh, the election fraud? He pulled an election fraud, and I think it was 1976, his third and last year as, as president of the USCCB. And even though the conference itself voted down communion in the hand, this guy pulled people outside of the vote, somehow pushed it through election fraud, and he got an indole so that old people in America can receive in the hand, even though, that we know, 500 years ago, that's the Protestant playbook for destroying belief in the real presence. And you can see the proof is in the pudding. Jesus said, judge it by its fruits. Now 90% of the Catholics don't believe. Why? Because they waltz up like fast food. And we know what they're receiving. Just like that woman pouring the precious blood back into her bottle. She didn't know what she was doing. Why? Because the bishops have failed to teach us. Nothing has changed, by the way. <laughs> Here's the other sacrilege story I'll never forget. I was newly ordained. 
was at my first parish for nine months. Thanks be to God, they had recently renovated, restored some of the church to its prior glory. And thus they had tile floor, not carpeting, but they still had the extraordinary ministers carrying the chalices of precious blood. You're not, they shouldn't even be touching the chalice. Anyway, my pastor at the time, Father Wiersba, recounted this story to me so that I would understand, I would have an understanding, because when you're in seminary, hopefully they're teaching you to be reverent, and you think everybody out in the parish is going to be equally reverent. So he told me this story it just happened. After Holy Communion was distributed with all the extraordinary ministers, you know, it's never the men, by the way, that, sorry, ladies, it's never the men that complain about stuff like this. It's always the Karens. It's, it's the Karens that write the letters to the bishops. And then we get called in like we did something wrong. Who are we supposed to be appeasing here? The Karen or the priest who brings you the Holy Eucharist? Well, anyway, he got back to the altar. And there on the altar sat a chalice with precious blood. Remember I said the rule is you're supposed to drink it before you come back so that you don't spill it, which is a stupid rule because you're going to more likely spill it on the way out. Well, anyway, there was the chalice, half full, and it was all like chalky, dirty, disgusting. And the purificator was soaked in red. Father, being a holy priest, knew what he had to do, so he consumed the chalice. And Mass is over. He's in the sacristy. Somebody runs in, Father, Father, come here, you've got to see this. Come quickly. Left the sacristy, walked out to the station where the extraordinary minister was distributing the precious blood. Which, by the way, to you know this, Trent says, if you dare say that you don't receive both body and blood in the Holy Eucharist, anathema sit, let you be accursed. You receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. And anybody who says anything differently from that, including the Karens, Anathema said, let you be accursed. And it meant it when it said it. I can't change the dogma of the church. Let you be accursed. You don't need a chalice of the precious blood to receive the precious blood of Jesus. You're going to receive him today. Anyway, Father Weirs believes it's actually follows this person out to the station. What had happened, whether it be the extraordinary minister or the recipient of the chalice, it spilled it on the tile floor. And what that extraordinary minister did was try to wipe it up with the purificator and then wring it out into the chalice, which explains why the chalice looks so disgusting, the precious blood, and why the purificator was soaked with precious blood. Well, if I ended right there the story, that'd be bad enough. But what that guy that went in to get Father Wiersba wanted to show Father Wiersba was that the extraordinary minister had done a terrible job of cleaning up the precious blood and there were footprints of precious blood. Extraordinary ministers are an abomination. They were instituted by Protestants 500 years ago to destroy belief in the real presence. They were instituted by a damned cardinal of the church Bernadine, who did not repent, or we would have heard about it. He stuffed that down our throats with election fraud, and I think it was 1976, as I said. It is an abomination. You don't have to take my word for it. Nine percent of the Catholics now don't believe. Remember 500 years ago what it looked like, what life was like. You didn't have running water. My parents grew up without running water in their house as children. 500 years ago, there was no running water. There was no hot water. There were no hot showers. There's no 40, 50, 60, 70 different types of soap on aisle three at Walmart. Hands were filthy. And when the Protestants had the people come up, when they took over the churches, when they confiscated the churches, they confiscated the Catholic church because they wanted the wealth of the Catholic church. Listen, it's the wealth of God. They stole from God. When Henry VIII confiscated the Catholic Church in England, he stole from God. And then the people got communion in the hand, 
They said, well, this can't be special. Nothing special about this bread because look at the filthy, disgusting hands that goes in. Remember, I washed my hands before, before I consecrate. 500 years later, you have Bernadine and the USCCB adopting the Protestant playbook, guaranteed to destroy belief in the real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. And we're still doing it today. At what point is the hierarchy going to figure out that their little experiment after Vatican II failed, failed miserably? The proof is in the pudding. You can judge it by its fruits. At what point? What's it going to take? How, why haven't they opened their eyes? to restore belief in the Holy Eucharist, to, just, to restore it, isn't to have some party with a bunch of bands playing all day long. All you need to do is be reverent. That's how you restore belief in the real presence. You restore the, the altar rail. You kneel and receive on the tongue, which is the universal proper way to do it in the church throughout the globe. If we want to believe in the real presence, let's be reverent toward it. Let's let everybody know. Let's have the bishops teach us that you don't pour the chalice back into the, prep, back into the bottle of wine and you don't mop it up off the floor. The real presence is why we're here. To affirm our beliefs in the Holy Eucharist. The real presence of our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity. I'll end with this bit of advice. Let's not be lazy about our faith. And when we're talking about such things as the Holy Eucharist, let us refer to it as the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. I say, I'm going to church. No, don't be lazy. You're going to the holy sacrifice of the mass, the representation of Calvary. Don't be lazy in our words, because our words mean something. And when you, through your example, show people that you believe in the real presence, and you don't show up at church in Daisy Dukes, I went, yeah, I won't go there. That's how you restore belief in the real presence. That's how you go from 90% who don't believe back to 100% before Vatican II that did. We know what 100% belief looks like. Let's just restore that, and you're doing a good job by being here today. God bless you all, and thank you for your own witness of faith to me. In nomine Pontius et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen.